the Tortuga Field Case Study by Jake Gibson, Muriago Voide, St. Manson, and Yasser Suleiman. We are needed in the Gulf of Mexico at the deep water oil field of Tortuga. Tortuga has been appraised but remains undeveloped. So we have been hired to investigate different development scenarios. We will use the following parameters as our base case, such as wellbore radius, open hole completion, and casing measured depth. The basic Tortuga PVT data is given on the screen. This PVT data resembles closely to a reservoir in Appendix B of a book called Petroleum Production Systems 2nd Edition. So we assumed similar viscosity, total compressibility, and oil formation volume factor. The following are typical Tortuga reservoir and completions data. This data will be used for calculating flow rates, pressure changes, and completions data. We were also able to solve for R sub E with a simple calculation available at the bottom of the screen. For our reservoir, we will be assuming pseudo steady state conditions after the initial train stand condition. Since the initial train stand condition is only 65 hours and is relatively insignificant to a possible 10 year production, we will neglect train stand flow from any future calculations for simplicity. To Vogel or not to Vogel, you might ask. Since we never hit the bubble point pressure throughout the reservoir's life, Vogel is never used and instead Darcy's equation was used. So which correlation do we use, you might ask. Since our base case well is nearly vertical, only 6.4 degrees off the vertical line, the Hagedorn and Brown method is used for the wellbore calculation between the choke and reservoir. But the Beggs and Brill method was used for the flow line calculation between the choke and separator. This is especially true because of the much longer measured depth relative to the true vertical depth that the flow line had to travel. To calculate for our base case skin, we had to use the following equations, and we also had to assume that our horizontal permeability is 10 times of that of our vertical permeability, and we ended up having a skin of a little bit over 3. Even though we were given two wells as our base case, we used one well only instead to simplify our calculations. But if we were to assume two wells rather than one, then we would have depleted all 5 million barrels in a little less than half the time of that of only one well. But since we only did use one well, so all future calculations were used for only one well. Displayed here is the pressure effect of what a particle would feel as it travels from the external boundary of the reservoir to the pressure separator. The pressure drop from the reservoir to the choke along with the flow line between the choke and the separator is due to friction. The large pressure drop across the choke is used to protect our surface equipment from damage. Shown here is the IPR versus TPR graph over the first year of production. The intersection of the IPR and TPR curves and the corresponding flow rate to that intersection is the flow rate at which the well should be flowing for the initial year. Two-phase flow through a choke has not been described well theoretically. To determine the flow rate of two phases through a choke, empirical correlations for critical flow are generally used. We use the empirical correlation of Gilbert, which allows us to have the P2 pressure over P1 pressure to go up to 0.7. If the ratio were to go over 0.7, subcritical flow will result and our flow will reduce through the choke. In the Excel spreadsheet, the only way to input different well completion data is to provide the skin of said well completion. So for the partial completion, this equation was used to find the skin contribution of the partial completion. 60 feet was used for H sub W in our calculations, meaning that only 60 feet of the total height of the reservoir, which was 80 feet, was used, hence the partial completion name. Shown is our cumulative production of four different completed wells. The obvious standout is the partial completion. This is due to a high skin and starts to hit subcritical flow within the third year. 
So I stopped recording data after three years, since any data past that third year would be false information, since our Excel spreadsheet expects us to honor the critical flow through the choke. If we zoom in closer, it would appear that only two lines exist, but rather the base case and vertical well lines are nearly identical. If we neglect our stock tank oil initially in place number and assumed production for 10 years, then the vertical well only produces 909 barrels less than that of the base case. This isn't shocking since there's only a 6.4 degree difference between the two. The 45 degree well stands out and would produce over 78,000 barrels more than that of the base case. All but the partial completion reaches 5 million stock tank barrels at some point. So the question now is, when do the different completed wells reach this volume? If we take a closer look, it's still nearly impossible to distinguish the base case well from the vertical well, since obviously there's only a 6 degree difference between them, so it's still not surprising. The base case takes a little over 5 years to deplete the whole reservoir of its 5 million barrels. In comparison, the vertical well only needs 17 more minutes of production time to reach 5 million stock tank barrels, and the 45 degree well actually saves 64 hours of production time compared to the base case. But in time span of 5 years, these differences are negligible. Now looking at an analysis of the wellbore radius of the production in Tortuga or Deepwater oil fields. There are certain assumptions that were made in order to get these calculations. We assume production from a 12 inch diameter tube from the well bore all the way to the choke and production from a 4.5 inch diameter flow line from the choke all the way to the separator. And in our oil field, we are producing from just one well throughout the entire life of the reservoir. Looking at the base case, as you can see, we plotted the TPR, which is located here, and plotted the IPR, which is located here. As you can see, when you change the wellbore diameter of the well that we are producing from, from various IPRs of 0 0.5 feet to 0 0.25 feet to 0 0.75 feet to 1 feet, the IPR doesn't change much, which tells you that the wellbore radius in the production of this Tortuga oil field doesn't have that great of an impact on the production. But if you take a closer look at the actual points of intersection between the IPR and the TPR, you can see that there is an optimum case which you get the most cumulative production and that will occur at a wellbore radius of 0 0.5 feet. As you can see, the cumulative production after five years of production, using a 0 0.5 feet wellbore radius will achieve the most production. Although the numbers are really close, the highest cumulative production will be achieved using a 0 0.50 feet wellbore radius. So to conclude, if you want to achieve the most production in this Tortuga oil field, you will be best served using a 0 0.5 feet wellbore radius. For part of the sensitivity analysis, we compared and discussed the effect higher and lower separator pressures have on the cumulative production over the course of 10 years in the field. Our hypothesis was that in most cases, a lower separator pressure will yield greater production and profits. We said that because fluid flow is governed by pressure differential. Therefore, we want a higher bottom hole pressure and a lower pressure at the top of the well, which can be accomplished by lowering separator pressure. Next, we ran the simulation in the Excel file, and this is the results that we found. At uh, 500 psi separated pressure, we had a cumulative production of just shy of our 5 million bar barrel limit, and that's after five years of production. And over here, we have our production, our cumulative production versus time. And then we went ahead and ran simulation again at the lower separated pressure of 300 psi. And again, just shy of 5 million barrels after 5 years. And then we ran it one more time 
for a higher separated pressure of 700 psi. And then once again, human production just shy of 5 million. So we saw really negligible changes in production using the three different separated pressures, and we believe this is because we are in critical flow. And the way we calculate critical flow in this worksheet is by using the rule of thumb that if P2 divided by P1 is less than 0.7, then we are in critical flow, where P2 is the pressure just after the choke and P1 is the pressure just prior to the choke. So as you can see here, we are in critical flow for all five years. And when we are in critical flow, that means the changes that we make beyond the choke, such as changing the separator pressure, will not significantly affect what happens downhole from the, in the reservoir. So that means that when we change the separator pressure, raised it and lowered it, it did not significantly affect our production from the reservoir. Hello, I'm going to talk to you about how the choke opening can affect the flow and the production. We use three different choke opening sizes. We use one fourth of an inch, one eighth of an inch, and we also use one half of an inch. When deciding what our base case should be, we kept in the back of our minds that we wanted to maximize production and we also wanted to have critical flow for all 10 years. What that means is, that our ratio of P2 over P1 had to be less than 0.7. So we chose 1 fourth of an inch because that was the maximum production that we could get while obtaining 10 years of critical flow. When we decreased our choke opening size to 1 eighth of an inch, we also obtained 10 years of critical flow, but our production decreased. And when we increased our choke opening to a half an inch, our production increased, but it hit subcritical flow at year five. And by year seven, it was physically impossible for it to flow because P1, well, was less than P2, when in fact we needed P2 to be less than P1. Here are the three graphs for each choke. Here's a half an inch, an eighth of an inch, and a fourth of an inch. And these graphs show us 10 years of production and the flow rate. In conclusion, we now know that when you increase the choke, you increase production, but the time that it takes to become subcritical flow increases, which is what we don't want. We always want to be critical in critical flow.